Hello and welcome to this evening's special 5x15 event as we launch a new occasional series with Rathbone's Folio Prize called Relative Values. And we're thrilled this evening to be joined by a wonderful panel of women writers, Deborah Mogach, Lottie Mogach and Lucy Hughes Hallett. And um, thanks for being with us, all of those who are watching live and on the catch up as we discuss nature versus nurture and explore families writing and much, much more. And at five by 15, we're delighted to be working on this first event with the Rathbones Folio, featuring Folio um, Academy members. And as I hope many of you will already know, the Folio team runs the annual Rathbones Folio Prize for the best work of literature of the year, often called the Writer's Prize because it's judged and nominated purely by writers. And the Folio Academy also runs a number of other schemes. It's mentorship scheme, which um, brings members of the Academy to mentor young graduates of the um, first story creative writing schools program, and also the Rathbones Folio sessions, of which this event is a part. So let me also introduce our chair this evening, Lucy Hughes Hallett. We're so pleased to have her back with us. She's a biographer, a cultural historian, and a, um, a novelist. And she's won the Samuel Johnson Prize, the Duff Cooper Prize, and the Costa Biography um, Award of the Year. She um, has written a brilliant book about Gabrielle D'Annunzio, which she came to 5 by 15 to talk about. The Sunday Times hailed it as the biography of the decade. Um, she was also chair of this year's International Man Booker Prize. And a couple of years back, she was a judge for the Rathbones Folio Prize. So don't forget to please put your questions in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screens. And I know Lucy's gonna to come to as many as she can towards the end of the session. But for now, I will disappear into the virtual wings and say welcome to you all and welcome Lucy, over to you. Thank you very much, Daisy. And welcome to everyone out there. Um, I want to introduce Deborah Mogger and her daughter Lottie Mogger and we're here to talk about them and their work but this is also as Daisy says the first of a projected series in which pairs of related authors authors in the sense of related in the sense that they actually are part of each other's families whether by marriage or by blood or whatever and of course in talking to to these um these twosomes of writers, we will be exploring the question of what makes a writer. Is it nature? Is it nurture? Do you learn by example? Um, do you, are you actively taught perhaps by your, your author parent? So let me introduce our two uh, speakers first. Uh, Deborah Mogger has written numerous books. Uh, including Tulip Feather, including These Foolish Things, which was then metamorphosed into the movie The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. Uh, Debbie has also adapted several of her novels as into movies. Um, she wrote the scripts for Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice and Nancy Mitford's Love in a Cold Climate. Uh, she knows writing from many different angles. And her other proud achievement is being the mother of Lottie Mogger, who is also joining us and who has herself written three novels. The first one, I mean, this is rather astonishing for a first novel, was adapted into a television series, uh, six parts, I think. So they are both successful novelists, one at you know, near the start of her career, one not near the end, but in her prime. <laughs> and I hope they're going to talk about their work as well as talking about their, what it's like being two writers in the same family. And actually, there's not just the two of you, are there? And Debbie, I'm going to turn to you first, because I know that you are also the child of, of two authors. Isn't that right? Will you tell us about your parents? Yes, my parents, Lottie's grandparents, um, were called Richard um, and Charlotte Howe. Richard Howe, my father, wrote, he once totted it up, 120 books. 120 books? Unbelievable. Under pseudonyms, he wrote books for children. Um, he wrote uh, naval biographies, rather sort of distinguished naval biographies. He wrote some sort of boys only books about the Second World War, because he was a fighter pilot in the Second World War. and. Um, masses of books. He, went, he I mean, he started out writing bubbles for comics. Um, so he was a good 
jobbing writer, quite distinguished, but also quite popular. And, um, and my mother, Lottie's grandmother, she wrote about 40 children's books for Faber's um, and Bodley Head. And they were, she did her own illustrations. And both of them were self-taught because they had been in the war. And when they came out, when the war ended, they had no training for anything. And as many people did, they didn't have time to go to college by then. They were sort of too old or too experienced in life. So they settled down and they, they forged careers writing and in my mother's case, illustrating. So I was used to when I grew up, we had a little cottage, we lived in a little cottage outside Watford, um, not much money. And I had several sisters and my parents sat side by side on the veranda. We couldn't call it a conservatory in those days. It was a veranda. Um, <laughs> typing away on their typewriters with these manuscripts sort of thickening beside them. So it was both something that I presumed all parents did. Um, and also at the same time, paradoxically, quite mysterious because I would see, for instance, I had a pony called Wally, a piebald pony, and I would see her appearing in my mother's illustrations. So it was both mysterious that I, it was in the bloodstream of, of her books, my childhood, and, um, but also just what I presumed all parents did. And did you therefore presume that when you were grown up, you would be writing as well? No, because I was too rebellious. I didn't want to do what they did. Um, and it took, it really, I mean, I did lots of other things. I was a waitress and I um, trained as a teacher and I worked in publishing and this and that. But the, the, the deciding thing was actually going to live in Pakistan um, in my mid twenties, just before Lottie was born. Um, and I think that it's terribly important for writers to, to be pulled out of their background and to be able to go somewhere where they're liberated. Because in my case, the parents were sort of, you know, over my shoulder. They were very supportive, but I didn't want their voices in my head. And I didn't want somebody to metaphorically be looking over my shoulder. And so going to live in Pakistan, which I did for two years, because then my then husband, Mr. Mogach, Lottie's father, um, ran Oxford University Press in Karachi for two years. And, um, and that was fantastically liberating because I didn't, I didn't have my parents' sort of shadow there. And, I, and um, I didn't have all the normal things that can inhibit one, like, you know, do you really think you can write? Or, you know, am I gonna be in it? Or look at all those books in Waterstones. How can you ever think you want to add to them? And I think a lot of writers have found that they have um, been able to kickstart their writing life by moving away from their, to become deracinated. Even going to a shed in the garden helps actually. Yes. And Lottie, so you obviously grew up with a writing mother and did it seem to you as, as, as Debbie says, the natural thing for a parent to be doing? Or did you feel that this was something maybe unlike the, the mothers of your school friends, for instance? Well, it was unlike the mothers of my school friends because um, she was always seemed to be, she, she only worked in the morning. And so I would never see her at work. It was this thing which she just did very discreetly and quietly. And she'd always be home when I was came back from school. And so it was something which was sort of done off screen. Um, and, I, yeah, so I, I suppose I did, I, I, I'm thinking, listening to mum saying that she rebelled, it makes me feel like I should have been more rebellious, but I never really considered doing anything else. I was a journalist um, for 15 years or so, um, but I always had in my mind that I'd be a novelist because I just, she was a very, very good PR for it. She, like I say, she didn't, I didn't actually see the, the pain involved because she just she did that in the three hours and she was very disciplined and she just had these she worked for three hours or four hours in the morning and um and she was also very positive about writing um and would say things like it's more fun than fun and she she made it sound like a very very good career choice I didn't have the wit to or the the gumption to rebel I just thought I'm doing that um and when I started doing it in earnest and I found that it wasn't more fun than fun. I felt I'd been slightly missold. Um, <laughs> I found it agonizing, but um, actually as I've gone on and I've published a few books, 
now. I can see why, and I completely understand why, um, well, she's a very positive person anyway, but also how important it is to try and enjoy the actual writing process because being published is, um, and for some lucky people I know it's an extraordinary event and their books exceed expectations. And But you know, being published is often also a lesson in like realizing how indifferent the rest of the world is to this thing you've been creating and slaving over and, you know, and obsessed with for two years. And so, you know, you really should try and enjoy the writing bit and try and not moan about it. also moaning writers are it's a very bad look I think it's it's um yeah it's, it's not it's not an attractive thing so anyway so now I see why um the importance of trying to be positive about it right and Debbie did you always feel it was more fun than fun no I mean I was doing a PR job for Lottie really <laughs> <You are. laughs> but I'm, I'm naturally quite a quite a ebullient person so that sort of leeches into it. But mm. no, I mean, you know, it's like banging your head against the computer until your forehead bleeds, sometimes, yeah. as Nick Hornby said. Um, but it was it's interesting just listening to Lottie that because I was, uh, in a way I had it easier because I was writing different sorts of books for my parents because that one was a children's writer, as I said, the other was a really basically a historian. And, um, and, Lot is, you know, I'm a novelist and Lot is a novelist. And so that that is something which is be interesting to 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 hear from her because we're, you know, each of Lottie's books are very different. She's I was thinking of Hilary Mantel's books until she wrote that Cromwell trilogy. Each of Hilary Mantel's novels were completely different. You didn't I love this comparison. <laughs> 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 Only your mother would. Uh, <laughs> but Lottie's are like that, so she sprung surprises with, with each book. But there is no denying the fact that she is, you know, a literary novelist, mm. as sort of I sort of am, and that mm. must be difficult. It's like, it's like going into a wood, finding the footpath, you know, bashed down by somebody. They've already been there, and then you get to the, end of the footpath, <laughs> and there are remains of a picnic with the old smoking fire and sort of <laughs> things. I've been there. You know, and, and what you want to do when you're starting to write is to bash th your own footpath. It's a good extended simile going on. <laughs> I think it's working. So, so that's, I think she's had it, hard, she's had it harder in that respect than, than I did. Um, I think, I don't know, I would I'd like, like to hear what oh. she thinks. Yes, so Lottie, do you feel that um, doing the same kind of thing as your mother is having it hard? Is that... Has that been in any way a problem? Um, well, I mean, the risk of sounding sort of nauseatingly like Pollyannish. I mean, I do think it's been like, it, it, there's been, uh, it's been wildly positive having my mom as my mom, as a, as a writer. But um, I suppose maybe that accounts for the fact that my first book, when, I mean, it did take me quite a long time to get to it, but also I, I tried various ones, which I sort of put aside like a historical book and various sort of contemporary, you know, sort of, books about family life and relationships and it was only when I found a subject which was I knew my mom wouldn't write about because it was it was about Facebook and social media and it was it was it was happening right now it was it, and I think that's I only really had the courage to finish that one because I knew it was a very in a very different sphere to, to mum's world of you know of, of like I say sort of, which I mean this was ages this was god it was 15 years ago now, it was when social media was just um, like a new thing and something, you know, and it's been so explored now, but um, but at the time it felt like it was vaguely new territory. And so that gave me um, the confidence, which, you know, you need su it's such an exercise in confidence and extended self-belief. But um, I think it, that's what sort of pushed me to actually finish that book um, and uh, it not just join the rest of the discarded half finished ones was the fact yeah. that, yeah, it was new. It was a new project. It was called Kiss Me First, um, which which was, <laughs> can I tell them that? Yeah, yeah, it's a mom, mom she's, uh, she's alluding to his mum gave me the title. It's a very good title. <laughs> <laughs> she gave it to me. I mean, I thought, God, I'd love to write a novel. And I, I thought of this title, I thought Kiss Me First. I couldn't think of a novel d at all. Um, or I was writing another one or something. So I said to Lottie, why don't you call your novel Kiss Me First? Stick a sentence or so in where obviously somebody says that. Um, and you <laughs> did it, and I still think it's rather a good title. But um, I did, I, I did, I, yeah. Because you told me there was some novel. I can't remember who it was who just 
And the, the only way um, point in her book, the, her title, it was, I can't remember, you'll remember what this is, but I it was the first yeah. line. It was, I think it was Elizabeth Bowen's To the North. Oh, that was it. A wonderful, wonderful novel. And as far as I remember, Lucy would, will know because she's more, read more, but um, I think it was just the last sentence or the last paragraph yeah. to, to the North. And I rather like that in books, but it's, it, it is, it is difficult not to, um, uh, be too bossy. I'm quite bossy as a, as a person, and and I and it's you, you know one has to hold back. The, the title was an exception, but <laughs> but otherwise I try not to interfere too much. But of course I'll read her manuscripts. We read each other's mm. books and we finish them. I don't think I don't think I've ever l looked at yours while you were in the middle of writing them, have I? Oh God, no, no, no! no. no. It's a ghastly, ghastly thought. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'd say you're my first reader. But I feel, I feel bad about it because it's, it's a horrible position to put you in because you know you have to be so diplomatic and you know writers are so touchy and all. And essentially, you want to be told that it's just brilliant. There's nothing to be done, and but obviously there's always things to be done. So you having to couch it in very kind diplomatic dinner it must be a real trial that actually <laughs> well no it's not we're, we're going to get too um uh sugary in a minute but it's it, it, <laughs> that, that i mean i've sometimes had some thoughts but but you listen to me and yeah. you do them which, which is completely yeah. great um I th we must stop being so nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well obviously the fact that you share the work and can can really talk shop um with, with full knowledge, um, that must have made you very close in a way that perhaps wouldn't have happened if you'd been doing completely different work. Do you think that's true, um, Debbie, what do you think? Oh, I think so. It's such a profound bond. It's a huge, hugely deep bond, that. Um, I'm trying to think if I can equate it with feeling about it, other novelists that, that we have that. No, I, I, I don't, because I mean, obviously like you, Lucy, and like Lottie, but, you know, I know a lot of novelists. Um, so I take that for granted, I suppose. It is, it, it's, it's, it's a very, it's an interesting relationship in that way. I hadn't, I hadn't put that into words. Lottie, what do you think? You... Well, I suppose, because we're both, we, we both, I mean, I know, you know, we're both drawing on similar you know uh, shared lives <laughs> and um and I, I suppose that's interesting isn't it i mean we both interpret them in different ways and we do, we are writing we are we have gone down different paths in terms of subject matter but yet you know in terms of relationships what all books are really about you know we we know the same relationships and we've um you know with and so that's is quite interesting seeing how they sort of translate in different ways into our various books you know I think not in recognizable ways but ways which we would recognize yes exactly other people yeah. wouldn't but yeah. I mean, the, the interesting thing is that, that that my novels have drawn on Lottie and her brother she's got a brother Tom um, a certain amount in fact a slightly embarrassing amount <laughs> probably um, and the children in my books which are you know some of them are not domestic at all but quite a lot are um, mm they have grown older as my children grow older and indeed the protagonists often grow older as I've got older and so I've used sometimes ruthlessly my own mm. children and in fact in my journalism I've done you know um, uh, which which I, I think has embarrassed them sometimes and Lottie's not used me as far as I know <laughs> in a trivial way at all I mean maybe no. the the the, the the, the, the fact that we both have a sort of novelist's mind where we're both not and we're, we're, we're not sort of mathematical or philosophical brained people or abstractly brained have are, have we are we lot lotty it's it's <laughs> no but, but, <laughs> no, but, no it's not. yeah but but all yeah. her novels you know the first one was set online hugely the second one was set in in spain in 2008 um, in, in southern Spain, and the third one was set in uh, um, uh, Brixton uh, uh, about a prisoner on day release, and they're all subjects which I've never touched anywhere near, and that's been really good because, you know, one, one doesn't want to be in, in any way, not, not in competition, but, but in the same arena, which, which we haven't been at all, actually. Thank God, unless she's writing one now about a 73-year-old woman <laughs> on the Kentish coast having 
just come out of a divorce. <laughs> if she does. Now's the time to tell you, is it? <laughs> um, Lucy, your daughter's a writer. Uh, yes, she, she's writing her first novel now. Um, so maybe one day she and I will be on this, <laughs> in this series. But she, uh, I remember when she was a child, uh, being rather hurt when I asked her whether she thought she might like to be a writer when she grew up. And she said, no, not really, because my life seemed to be so boring. <laughs> I just sat alone in a room, never talked to anyone, never met anyone. And she didn't want that life. But mm -hmm. happily, um, as, as an adult, she's decided that she actually loves Sounds doing Sounds healing, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But actually, back to what somebody was saying, one of you was saying earlier about confidence, um, and Lottie was saying, I think it's, it's fantastically important to have confidence, this is in general, not, nothing to do with me or Lottie, um, to have that extraordinary confidence as a writer. And a lot of writers aren't confident people at all. They're shy and retiring and feel social failures yeah. and things. Um, uh, and you have to have the confidence that people are going to give their precious time and their precious money, but more their time, to read about people who don't exist and who've just mm. come out of your head. And the miracle of that never ceases to amaze me. And all novelists I know think that our collars are going to be felt by somebody who's going to come and say, you know, you've got away with this long enough. So it's very nice that Lottie's joined the the the, 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 the fray, but but I think that Lottie is not as confident as I am as a person. Um, but mm. one has to, when you sit down at a desk, you have to psych yourself up and tell yourself everyone is wanting to know about Mary or Donald, whoever they are, you know. Um, because they're interesting and um, you have to have that even if you don't have it in the rest of your so-called normal life, whatever normal life is. Let's step away for a, for a moment from, from you two specifically and, and think about the question of how, how a novelist comes to be. And Debbie, you just a, a few minutes back used the phrase the mind of a novelist or a novelist's mind. Um, how do you acquire a novelist's mind? Is it by being the child of other writers or is it something, regardless of who your parents might be, something you're born with? Were you both introduced to reading by your parents very young, for instance, does that help? Lottie, what do you think? Um, reading, definitely. Um, I yes, I used to read all the time. I think like most writers would say that. Um, in fact, I, I think the worst thing about writing is it makes reading less less of a pleasure. Well, for me anyway, because you um, often were like when if, you're, I'm, if I'm writing fiction, I can't really read fiction because it throws me or I get jealous or I think I should do something differently. And so so yeah, it sort of slightly robs you of that um, the pure sort of unabashed pleasure of reading, which is during those formative years, which I think does. Um, does uh, yeah uh, is crucial in like your development as a writer. Um, so yeah, apart from I mean I think in my case it's getting a bit too personal again though because I think at gem like mum is a very um, like you say lots of writers are quite sort of diffident people and not very gregarious. Mum's I think quite unusual in that she's a, a confident gregarious person and also she's a real storyteller in her everyday life. I think lots of writers I know they sort of squirrel they have a little notebook and they think of something or they see something they squirrel it away in their notebook and they put it in that you know and it's for their book but mum is much more sort of expansive and generous and she's constantly like shaping life into just telling good stories and so sort of storytelling was always was just it's just every I had daily lessons in how to shape life into like into narrative basically because that's what because that's just mum does it very naturally and so I, I don't know if that's particularly typical of um of children of writers like I say most of them, most of the ones I know are slightly more um yes le less uh less uh what's the word what's the word mum just not such good not such not such good storytellers in their everyday life I think yeah yeah I mean it's interesting because you know you Lucy know a lot of writers as well and you can't tell by their character what sort of books they're going to write because mm. I know several novelists who evince no curiosity about mm. other people at all absolutely none you'll you'll have a whole 
dinner with them or a weekend with them and they don't ask a single question <laughs> and seem to take nothing in at all mm. um, and seem totally oblivious of other people. But it's all going in somewhere um, mm. or else, of course, it, of course, it's partly it's spinning out of your head and it's partly con constructed in your head or all that. We, it's a very complicated business. Um, and I know other writers who are frightfully sociable and, um, you, you know, give a, give out a lot, which, which um, there was a very good article once about the difference between journalists and writers saying journalists are a lot more fun because they share stuff and they're finding out things, they're nosy. Um, and writers are quite sort of constipated. They keep it all in because they're <laughs> mulling it over and they're not letting other people know, you know, what it is. Both my parents actually were... Uh, sociable people they had endless dinner parties and, and god knows what um and and in a way perhaps if one was quieter one might write better novels I, I i i don't know i sometimes i mean when i read my own novels they're always more shallow than i meant them to be they i always <laughs> feel that that they are that i've had deeper thoughts than than what comes out on the page with one or two exceptions one or two novels but anyway that, that's another another story really but going back to this idea of the the person who is born as a novelist, whether that concept is valid or not, um, Debbie, you have had three sisters. Are any of them writers? Well, yes. My sister Sarah, Sarah Garland, she is a children's uh, writer and illustrator, um, picture books and all sorts of books, and a, a wonderful book about a Syrian refugee, actually, called Azzy. Um but, um, and, my, and then I've got another sister who's a physio, who's written a physio book, but that's rather different. And then I had another sister who's died, who, who was very creative, although a bit dyslexic. So um, it's, it's, it sort of has run in the family, but I think that, that having a literary family, rather back to what you were asking a bit earlier, Lucy, that having a family where books are around and you can, uh, people talk about books and you read. My own parents weren't particularly literary, actually. My mother read Woman's Own and Daily Mail and stuff, you know, and they, they, they read the New Yorker and things, but they weren't hugely bookish. Um, but books were around and we, they, they knew what they were talking about, you know, that we talked about books a certain amount. But, but I wasn't at all bookish. I ran around shooting my sister with a toy gun and reading the Beano. <laughs> so um, I, 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 I wasn't particularly literary. Um, Lottie was much more. L Lottie was read all the time, the whole time. She read and read and read and read, which was a huge joy to me. Um, so, and that all fed into what she's writing, which is, which is great. And Lottie, that reading, mm. was that something that your mother was encouraging or was it something that you just found your way to? Um, I don't remember. I mean, I'm sure she did encourage, but I don't. I don't remember that. I just remember just doing it in that sort of slightly manic. Yeah, when you find this sort of that passion that you had. To, I remember I had, to, I had to read for an hour before I went to bed. The thought of reading, not you know, just going to bed without reading. And my son's like that now. Actually, it's just sort of it's sort of, he gets all panicky if he hasn't got a book. Um, the sort of, maybe it's a prop. Who knows? But um, I'm sure she did encourage it. But I, I don't remember. I don't remember it. Um, yeah, but they, it was, I think, I think also the, you know, maybe the difference between, because there are lots of parents encourage reading, but, you know, obviously the, having someone who's in, the, who's a writer and who's in the business and it makes it feel, you can sort of maybe make that leap from being an avid reader and loving books to thinking you might be able to write one yourself, because it seems this world is accessible and, you know, if, if you don't know any publishers or what, you know what you need an agent all this stuff was just around me from the very start um so it all felt it felt like i could do it and i think that's i mean that's a massive you know that's a, like uh, talk, going back talking about pluses of having a right as a mother but that's a, such a huge one isn't it feeling that it's not a closed shop it's, it's something, it's something can that can be you done could you yeah. could um, enter it's possible which is yeah it's very extremely valuable and did you ever have, did you ever consider other options? Did you have other non-writerly ambitions? Not really. I was a, no, not really. No. I was a journalist for a bit, like I said, um, and no, I never really thought of anything. Um, and partly, yeah, I just, I'm not that, 
maybe I just didn't even try and develop in other areas, but it felt now, and it certainly feels now that I, there's nothing else I could do. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, my... Not good at anything else. But actually, it's interesting that about being growing up in a, a, a writerly home, even if it's not particularly bookish, like my parents or, or, um, mm. or one's not particularly encouraged, because it, 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 it's what Lottie was saying is very true, because I teach sometimes at Arvon courses, and you have 16 students come and they're two writers and you read each other's work and it's very fascinating. But it's a real wake up call to what it's like for most people. Because a lot of people who come to it, they say that the four days of Narbonne course is the only time they've got when people aren't saying, what are you doing scribbling away again? You know, where's my dinner or, you know, all that stuff. And it's, it's very easy to forget that for most people, the writing world, let alone the writing process, is very alien and and um, difficult to imagine oneself put putting oneself in. Um, and in the Arvon courses, you know, most of the people who came, some of them improved unbelievably in that four days. And then they were going back, and you felt worried for them that they were going to slip back into a world where nobody had a clue what they were talking about because of vocabulary of writing and writers and words and stories was uh, something which they weren't familiar with, better or worse. Yeah. And Debbie, when it became clear that Lottie was going to have a go at, at writing, were you anxious for her? I mean, you've been very successful, but you also know lots of writers who don't make it and have quite a heartbreaking time. So it's quite a scary thing for your, your child to be launching out onto, isn't it? I was terribly anxious for her, terribly. I mean, um, I I think that I actually, to be frank, I think that I slightly dissuade, try, try, well, she'll tell you, but um, she was doing very well as a journalist and she was having such an interesting time. Mm. Um, and because, for instance, the London newspaper just started and she was in the beginning of it and was the, the person doing the entertainment and literary stuff, which was, you know, all great, great fun for someone so young and so many jobs aren't so much fun anymore and journalism was and um so i thought it's a huge huge punt to to write a novel and if it's not successful or if she can't do it she'll feel a failure because she doesn't have much self-confidence and how much better just to be a journalist whizzing around the country you know interviewing she did some amazing interviews it was you know and it's fun writing mm -hmm you know, isn't as much fun. So when the first, when Kiss Me First was um, finished, I, well, as I said, I was terribly relieved it was so good and so original and interesting. Um, but but I, I did have my doubts before then and was worried. I was worried for her. I, I, I think I said, Lottie, why didn't you just stick with the journalism for it? But mm. did I? Yeah, um, uh, yes, you did. And um, obviously there are times, you know, as we all know that, with writing it takes a very long time to get any sense of achievement or have anyone like reward you or say well done or anything and you know journalism you get that every day you close the day you file your piece and that's you know I didn't realize how much how important that was until until I'd uh yeah until I had given it up but um no you definitely and you're right you're right like whizzing around um doing restaurant reviews and you know going to see free going to free parties it was, it was fun it was fun but um but it's I don't also, it. And it was also a form of writing, and there isn't quite such a hard line as you seem to be drawing between yeah. journalism and, and book writing. Yeah. You were, you know, you were stringing sentences together. Yeah. And no, do, no, do you no, think no. that was a? Um, are, are you now glad that you sort of acquired the skills that a journalist needs? Are they helpful in novel writing? I'm not sure actually, because especially my last journalism job, as Mum mentioned, was doing it was a sort of one of those tabloids, um, those free evening week papers which littered London for you know like in 2006, um, and everything was so short that when I started novel, like it was getting out of the habit of just being extremely short and concise, you know, like I'd get a scene over in like 300 words and actually I sort of reteach myself to sort of elaborate and enlarge and it's actually, you know, it wasn't a useful skill at all, actually, quite the opposite. <laughs> right. But, um, yeah, to ask 
obviously the same question as I asked Debbie. I mean, if your son were to suddenly announce that he wanted to be a writer, would you feel anxious? Would you say, oh my goodness, you better get a qualification first? Or would you? Oh God, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, I, yeah, I'm very- He's probably I'm, a bit young anyway. <laughs> probably he is a bit young at the moment, but um, but yeah, I'm very much hoping he's, because I think we've got enough novelists now. We need someone practical, like someone, <laughs> a builder would be good or someone who can, um, yeah, can make things with their hands or but mm. um yeah I yeah I mean I think I mean I feel like the, the landscape has changed quite a lot from when mum started writing to when I did and I mean god knows what it'd be like when my son who's currently nine if he started to do it um you know it's it's I remember when mum started you saying that any debut writer would get you know you'd get nicely reviewed in lots of places and people would be mean you know that's sort of, like a gender sort of an agreement that people would be kind to debut novelists it's, it's a sort of a kinder environment um and you know and now it's possible you can write your book and there's you know, like get no reviews at all and it can just completely disappear it's sort of, it feels like a slightly it's a tough environment so i don't know god knows what it'll be like in 20 years time but um yeah uh, uh yeah i don't think I'll, i i don't know how I'll, how i'll feel if he announces that Okay. Um, I just want to remind the audience that do please put questions in the Q and A box if you want to, and I will, you know, I will then pass them on to Lottie and Debbie. And I've got an interesting question here from someone in the audience, saying, "This is addressed to both of you. Are there any topics you'd avoid writing about in order to spare the blushes of your mother or daughter?" <laughs> so Debbie over to you first is there anything that you think you would feel anxious or would be inhibited in writing about <laughs> I wish you had but yeah <laughs> I know exactly I mean I think I have embarrassed them so I, so I think I've done that it's 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 terribly embarrassing having a parent writing anything about sex terribly yeah. and sometimes if I'm writing a scene that might be a little bit of that I, I, I just close off thinking about my children because I, you can't write it. Um, I mean, I try to not gratuitously uh, <laughs> write explicit stuff about sex, but I, I, I do occasionally. And um, I just don't want to think about it. It's like thinking of one's own parents. It's, it's a horrible thought. <laughs> I mean, I, lastly, um, there's some things I haven't written about. Um, I'm, I mean, I have used them. I'm trying to think how often I've used them ruthlessly. I, I, I wrote a very autobiographical novel when they were tiny, close to home, um, which wasn't embarrassing for them because they were just little toddlers then, my son and my daughter. Um, but then I've, I've used them, I've certainly used them later on when they were teenagers, um, sometimes in journalism, as I said, and sometimes in novels. I mean, I'd be interested to know from Lottie what she found embarrassing about, or annoying, or feeling I shouldn't have done it when I've written about you, stuff that you've done. I think writing you know, about the spots, when I, when I had terrible spots, I think that's, 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 that's the only one I can think of actually, which felt, um, which felt, I was a bit stung by. Oh gosh, <laughs> yes, um, awful. But uh, that's not, you know, that's, you've written like many, many books, like 17 novels, so I suppose that's um, one moment in yeah. all of those you've had. <laughs> But I certainly nick stuff from you. Um, I stole stuff uh, often with your permission, but I would ask you about how people would speak because the one the I think the most difficult people to write about is is adolescents if you're no longer adolescent because adolescents by their very nature cut themselves off from grown ups with their own language and their own everything, mm. and they feel like an alien species much more than any other age group because they're forging their own way in the world, and it's difficult to write about them, I've found. Um, you know, one knows underneath it, they're just the same old, you know, loves and insecurities and things. But, um, so I've asked um, Lottie and Tom, her brother, about stuff, mm. a, a certain amount. Not much, I don't think, have I? No, not that much, actually. And yeah. it's, and I think easier to do it with our generation than trying to write about teenagers now would just be, God, can you imagine just with their digital, they're just, it's such a different, like, yeah, emotional yeah. climate, you know, with the, the, um, like just trying to vaguely write about people's online lives to just be, yeah, I feel like it'd just be disastrous. Yeah, yeah. Embarrassing. 
you know. That's so Lottie, you, you show Debbie your work. She's your first reader, you said. Yes. And yeah. so it's not, so you're, you're not anxious about allowing her access to your, your imaginary world. Um, I mean, I'm anxious in the, not so much in the material because I do try, like I say, I haven't really, um, my subjects maybe on purpose, although it doesn't feel like that, but I've chosen these subjects which aren't London, but domestic, they, so they've got no connection with my life. They like, they're, yes, they're, they're quite far from my life. And so it's, but I'm embarrassed about the, you know, the impoverished language and, you know, the, I'm embarrassed about the actual writing, um, but not so much about the subject. Um, I've done, I mean, I have a few, very few mentions of sex. I generally, I don't particularly like writing about sex anyway. I find it embarrassing myself, let alone like thinking of other people reading it. But um, yeah, so no, it's more, it's more about just, you know, when you, and it just takes one other person to point out that you use the same adjective over and over again, you know, just your little embarrassing writing ticks and, and mum's that person as the first reader. So that, that's what I'm, I feel most embarrassed about actually. Yeah. It's absolutely yeah. agonizing. I remember, um, you know, when you, I, I think one of your boyfriends, you sort of sat on him while he read your manuscript, but yeah. you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't let him go because, <laughs> because it's such awful, it's so ghastly when people are reading it and then they sort of stop and they go and make a cup of tea or they <laughs> leave it around and you see they've only got to page 12. And so quite a good thing is just to sit on them till they... Till they <laughs> <laughs> I'd never thought of doing that. <laughs> I'm getting questions from the audience asking about other writer families. Are there any of the sort of, you know, the, the great literary families of the past who either of you particularly admire, say the Bronte sisters or? Uh... Well, mum knew um, Kingsley, uh, the Kingsley and Martin Amos. Because um, right. mum, mum's dad, uh, my granddad was a great friend of Kingsley Amos. So you kind of observed that a bit, didn't you mum? Yes, yes. I I once did um, go up to Martin Amis at a party and say my dad just loved your father more than practically he loved anyone. And um, I don't think he said anything. I think he just walked off, actually. <laughs> and I thought it was rather rude. But um, so I haven't got a... I, I hardly knew Kingsley. But right. but um, funnily enough, I was thinking of, of um, a Carmela Shansi who might be doing one of these with any luck and her mother, Muniza. She was, again, like us three generations because her grandmother also was a writer before partition. Um, she was in India. Um, they were Muslim family, but they came to Pakistan after partition. Um, that, that, that was a three, three lot. You think it'll sort of, you know, dwindle away after three um, and, and we may have stopped, stopped it. I was going to say stop the rot, but I don't really <laughs> think <stop> the rot. <laughs> I think it might, you know, the, the, the gene pool may get more and more watery or something. I, I don't know. Or, or, although, you know, maybe one of my darling grandchildren will be a writer. I mean, I would love them to be it because it's, you know, when it goes well, it's uh, it is more fun than fun. But I must say, um, it's not. You know, it can be not that great. I must say, <laughs> the worst thing is the fact that, that that you work all day, well, you sit all day, not work, sit all day, staring at a typewriter, and you haven't done any good in the world at all. You haven't even, you know, pulled the hairs out of the plug hole in the bath or done anything. <laughs> um, and I don't want to bequeath that. I hate to bequeath that to my daughter. Um, <laughs> So let's 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 hope she has a bit more fun. <laughs> I, I know you feel the same as me about it, actually, yeah. Lottie. So, I'm only, um, so Debbie, you've worked, uh, you've written scripts, you've adapted your own novels for for the screen. That's a, a very different, more collaborative process, I guess, isn't it? Well, that's. I mean, it's interesting you say that because that's that does suit me because I, in a way, I don't have the solitary. Um, characteristics of many novelists as we were saying earlier and I love I love working with other people um I mean a good script meeting is a really deliriously wonderful thing that's partly because I'm closeted away writing novels so much at the time but if I'm writing a screenplay and and you have a script meeting you've got a good director and producer and script editor and, things, and you sit around throwing ideas around and saying you know but but surely you know Douglas is jealous of Jason he must be and then you think oh god of course I didn't even think of that and you then roll roll along and work together and it's 
it's really, it's, it's heaven actually. Um, but I mean, I've found that an awful lot of screenplays I write don't get done and that's extremely frustrating. I mean, I think Damon, on oh, Ring Lard now, or Damon Ronnie, anyway, they had um, 14 screenplays weren't, weren't produced. And I do think, you know, to then write the 15th, if 14 of your things haven't been produced. And, and of course, with the novel, it's, you're much, 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 much freer. So that no, no one can stop you writing, can they? You're no not having to stop. wait for the funding or whatever. Exactly. And you can send them <laughs> to Hawaii tomorrow if you want. You know, <laughs> and nobody's going to say they can't afford it. And um, so it's been a huge pleasure being able to go from one to the other. Because when I get fed up with screenplays never being done, um, I can say, well, bugger that and go off into a private world writing a novel, which which is then at that moment deliriously freeing um it you know gets more of a grind further on but at that moment it's lovely and lottie were you involved with the dramatization of your first novel when it would uh, became a television series um, i wasn't at all um and that's because the person who did it with brian brian elsley he wrote skins and he was far like he was so he's a visionary person like you know it was, it was he he completely he took my idea and made it into something entirely new. Um, so no, I wasn't involved in it, and um, which was suited me completely fine. Um, but I still like they invited me on set, and I had one of this one of these very extraordinary moments where I went. It was this huge studio out somewhere outside the sort of North Circular, and they had and walked into they done this huge stage, and they had done a mock up of the my heroine's house but sort of life size it was like it was like sort of an art installation a life size version of a house and you'd go and, and all you know christmas wrapping paper up on shelves and old letters lying around and that was very very extraordinary because that's the he did keep the characters and they were true to it was true to her character and so suddenly being actually inside the house of a character you created was a very like one of those very extraordinary like, you know writing does give you occasional very extraordinary moments and that was and that was one of them, but but no, I didn't I didn't have any any input into the script at all. And is that something you'd like to do? I mean, if, um, yeah, if another guess, of your novels was going to be adapted, would you ask if you could God. be part of the? I was, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very it'd be a wonderful skill to learn. I think, it, and I think it's one of those things which you imagine is quite easy. Partly because you know the set. I remember trying it once, and you get final draft. That's some sort of software. Um, you can write something which looks like a script really easily and you have your beats and so you feel that you're doing it and actually you know it was my it was completely terrible and it's a real skill so I think it'd be quite it'd be useful uh, be interested in learning it definitely if anyone wants to um <laughs> wants to teaching me I'm not going to ask mum she's got enough <laughs> um, and here's another question from the audience Debbie uh, when did you first realize or, or think that Lottie would be a writer was, was it obvious well, I know it's a very good question because it was what I was thinking before we came on air. Um, I knew it from a very early age because she just had it. Um, I remember my father, I wrote something rather when I was a teenager. I didn't write much, as I said, but 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 he, he just left a note on it saying, you are a writer, which was the most wonderful thing. And I might have done the same to Lottie. I hope I, I gave her the encouragement, even if I didn't write the note. I knew she had it, and it's really interesting. You because you can well you you would know this, Lucy. Um, you you can just sniff it out straight away, and um, even if you know, I've 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 read novels by people who really you know the plots really don't go anywhere, and they can be quite disappointing in some ways. But they know how to make those sentences clunk together, and to make those people come alive, and to say something surprising and it's just it it you just know it. I mean back to Arvon it was interesting trying to sort of teach creative writing I don't know if you've done that Lucy but it's it's very difficult to teach it people just have it and I think it may be inherited a certain sort of um, uh, character just the way one's mind works I, I, I think maybe 
I, I don't know. I mean, nature, nurture, that's what this is all about. And I still... Well, exactly. Food, actually. <laughs> I yeah, really I mean, this, this brings us back to what is supposed to be the theme of this yeah. evening, that we, we are allowed to digress. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, in our, our writers, do they spring fully formed? Or are they shaped? Are they taught? I'm inclined to think that they they do spring fully formed, actually. I, I think that just as however many hundreds of thousands of hours I were to practice for, I would never be very good at playing tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can put sentences together and I don't quite know how. I do know that reading is absolutely essential. I mean, you, you learn to write by reading just as musicians presumably learn to play by listening. Yeah. But uh, I mean, can either of you remember any anyone sort of outside of the family this time, but teachers or books you read that were very influential for you or anything which really helped to set you on your way? Lottie. Um, shall I answer? Um, yes. Okay, I mean, Lottie next. I, I, uh, Lottie may agree because she probably read this and I'm sure she did read them, but I found William books when I was mm. little. Fantastically brilliant because Richmond Crompton who wrote them treated you as an adult um, as you read them or treated you as not as a child anyway I don't know what she treated one as but the words like advert you know testily and unctuously um, and William ejaculated quite a lot which I which I was, which I was a wonderful <laughs> verb um, I didn't quite get it but not that he meant that but um, they they were very influential because also the fact that William was much more real than people that I knew. And I still think of him as a real person, still, you know, st stuck at 11 years old. And I think of him in the present tense as great art is in the present tense, isn't it? Mm. You know, full staff, we, we say full staff is, we don't say full staff was because he's so vivid to us. So William books really got me going. As I said, most it was Beano and stuff. Lottie was a much, much better reader than I was as a young, Right. Well, I also, I like, yeah, I, I agree with you on William books. I'm trying to think. I mean, I think um, the book which has sprung to my head is, it's, I, I'm trying to think of the author. It feels silly to say that this is a hugely influential book when I can't remember it, but Eleanor Fargian is called The Silver oh, yeah. Curtain. What's, sorry, say it? Eleanor uh, Fargian. That's it. The yeah. Silver Curly. I just oh. meant, anyway, the, like, it's just, there's several, I mean, you know, I'm sure everyone has their sort of seminal childhood books, but I think that was the one which, um, I haven't read it for, you know, 35 years, but it just really, yeah. very simple writing. I think that's, you know, it's just, you realise that you don't have to do fancy, you know, it's not about fancy adjectives. It's like what you think maybe you grow up thinking is some good writing actually isn't. And often good writing is the opposite of, you know, as a child, what you imagine to be you know finding the most complicated words you could for, for something that you can think of and like and plonking it down but um yeah but I agree with you I agree with you the William books were a source of complete like joy and pleasure they yeah. are wonderful aren't they I, yeah. I agree. very good choices there Eleanor <laughs> Fargin too I think is a terrific writer uh, we're getting more questions but most of them frankly you've covered but um Here's, here's one which we haven't really thought about. What advice would you give to young writers in today's environment? Uh, that's a hard one. Uh, Lottie, what would you, any advice? How can people? God, well, I mean, I think the only, would just be finding a way to either just accept that you're going to be checking your emails like every 30 seconds and just not try and fight. I mean, I spend my, I'm just thinking about the difference between the way I work and mum. And I think the great difference is that she's not as addicted to email or the internet as I am. And so it's just, it's just try, and you spend so much time trying to fight that and feeling terrible and feeling you've wasted your time. And I think finding a way in which you can be at peace with, and not, and not just beat yourself up the whole time about not being able to concentrate for longer than like five minutes or however long our concentration spans have been shot to um, by this point. Um, I think that's, you know, whether that's one of those freedom programs you can get where you can put a lock on the internet to stop and you, know, it, you can do it in little tranches of time, whatever you want, or, or like I say, or just accepting that that's how 
that's how life is now and, and not trying to not just feeling terrible about it the whole time. I yeah, I think that's very sensible. I mean, yeah. people talk about it. I write a, a lot of nonfiction as well as fiction. Mm. And um, it's very often that nonfiction writers will talk about how they take, you know, two years to do the research and then two years to do the writing. And no one ever mentions the bit in between when you're staring out of the window thinking, I've got all this material. What am I going to say about it? If you just regurgitate it, you're not going to write a very interesting book. So I think that that staring out of the window and just thinking, you mm -hmm. uh, feel very depressed at the end of a day of doing that and think I haven't gotten any, anywhere, but it's a necessary part of the process. Isn't it it? Is. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, my, my um, tip would be terribly, terribly important, I think, which is to not start writing until you know your characters pretty well. Um, and you know what they, look like and what, what they do if they saw somebody shoplifting or if they got stuck in a lift and their shoes and if they're bullied at school and ask yourself questions about them for days and days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks or however long it takes until they've thickened up and then it's not so panic stri striking to start writing because a novel is such a chaotic thing anything could happen anything they could go to Greenland they could kill slit somebody's throat god knows what they could do. but once you know them they will help you tell their plot and if you if you plunge in too early before you know the characters well it's chaos um mm. so i i would i would say that as a sort of tip um and and the email thing actually lot is wrong i look at emails the whole bloody time oh, do you? <laughs> I, I, I go onto the guardian website about 12 because it changes all the time cleverly so I go on that endlessly to get to I do. Okay, I, I imagine that you just have these three like laser focused hours in the morning uh, if you have romanticizing your working habits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are nearing the end of our time, sadly. So I think I'm going to ask you one last question, which I'll ask to both of you. Um, you may not find it easy to answer and you don't have to answer if you don't want to but supposing both of you were to be shortlisted for the same literary prize this could happen couldn't it um who would you hope would win uh debbie you answer first well lottie I've, I've, never, <laughs> I've never ever understood people who are jealous of their children's success or uh, uh, are rivalrous. It seems to me that one longs for one's children to do better than one does oneself, or whatever. I would, I would, I would be mortified if I won it and she didn't. I would, I would die of of misery. Really? <laughs> yeah, really. Well, Lottie, you're at a different stage in your life, <laughs> and um, and daughters can make mothers happy by succeeding so i know i feel i feel now having heard that then i'll have to no <laughs> she's your mother i will mean, do that pain of, of herself. so I'll, yeah i'll accept it on that you, yeah quite right okay <laughs> okay well thank you both this has been a really enjoyable and thank interesting you. conversation thank you. so i'm going to hand us back to daisy thank you that was so interesting <laughs> thank Such you for asking it was such a great discussion. It was such a wonderful hour spent in your presence and it actually flew past. So I hope that um, this will be the first of many in the series of relative values with 5 by 15 and the Rathbones Folio Prize. It has been a really um, delightful hour. So thank you also, Lucy, for your excellent chairing, for bringing lots of the audience questions in. Um, and I wanted to just flag up our books, The Black Dress by Deborah Morgak. Brixton Hill by Lottie Morgak, Peculiar Ground by Lucy Hughes Hallett, all of those are available and Newman Bookshop, our brilliant community bookshop, will be delighted to help you. Um, but for this evening, I'm afraid that's all that we have time for. Just thank you very much to the Rathbones Folio Prize, to Minna Fry and the whole team for helping us bring this together. And um, thank you to you three brilliant women writers and thanks for sharing so generously your experiences and we will see you all again very very soon but for now good night goodbye thank you <laughs>